all of us on the Library Foundation are extremely happy, and I am especially happy to, to present tonight's sold-out program commemorating 100 years since the armistice that ended World War I, which was supposed to be the war to end all wars. World War I generated a tremendous amount of literature, poetry, and music, some of it familiar like the novels of Hemingway, some of it less so from the soldiers on both sides and the people at home waiting for the war to end. Tonight, we'll hear some of those voices, thanks to our outstanding guests. In the far seat is Mark Jordan. He's a longtime friend of the, li of the library. He's an actor, teacher, and a historian. You may recognize him from previous Live from the Library programs on the Lewis and Clark expedition and commemorating Shakespeare. He trained at several leading London arts institutions, including the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts and the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Next to Mark is Rhonda Taylor, who's been active in community theater for over 20 years. She's also the lead singer for an 80s cover band called Take Cover and the classic rock band The Pushbacks. And our third performer today is Rob Seidelman. He's an actor, writer, and director who has appeared locally at the American Conservatory Theater, Berkeley Rep, and the Berkeley Playhouse. He's also spent a decade running theater programs in high schools throughout the Bay Area. Live from the Library is produced by the Walnut Creek Library Foundation and features public lectures, library events, and cultural programs at the Walnut Creek and Ignacio Valley Libraries. We are very grateful and cannot do this without our generous sponsors, the East Bay Times and the Minuteman Press in Lafayette. I also want to extend special thanks to the Program Committee of the Library Foundation headed by Carol Weinstra, the Secretary of the Walnut Creek Library Foundation and AV expert, Cindy Jordan, <laughs> and our wonderful staff, including Executive Director Susan Moon and Programs Director Kelly Nero. Now please join me in welcoming Mark, Rhonda, and Rob. Thank you all for being in here, and the fact that her name is Cindy Jordan and mine is Mark Jordan is totally coincidental. A <laughs> hundred years have elapsed since the signing of the armistice ending World War I. Known as the war to end all wars, it had an enormous impact on the countries directly affected by the war, and more crucially on its participants. The war produced an outpouring of literary efforts by soldiers who fought, and many who died, and by persons on the home front, men and women, whose lives were tragically shaped by the war. Tonight you will hear those voices, voices from battlefronts east and west, and the home front, voices of English, Scots, Irish, Canadian, French, German, Australian, and American, who in languid or tormented verse, in humorous, humorous or serious veins, recounted their experiences. As one, Wilfred Owen noted, my subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. I think it is also fair to say that the pity is definably in the poetry. Before I commence bringing you those modern voices, we would like to share two ancient voices on war who had completely differing attitudes towards war. The first is Horace, a Roman poet who created one of, the wars, one of war's great dictums, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. If you don't know Latin, the translation will be made clear by the end of the evening. The other is that of Erasmus, the 16th century humanist. War is sweet only to those who have not experienced it. Tonight, we will share with you the reactions of those who experienced the First World War you can determine which of these ancient dip dictums is applicable. Nineteen fourteen, Archduke Ferdinand assassinated. Outbreak of war in July and August. Germany invades Belgium. First Battle of the Marne. First Battle of Ypres. Trench warfare begins. The Siege of Antwerp and the Christmas truce. A month ago, Europe was a peaceful comity of nations. If an Englishman killed a German, he was hanged. Now, 
if an Englishman kills a German or a German kills an Englishman, he is a patriot who has deserved well of his country. The war meant purification, liberation from the toxic comfort of peace. Thomas Mann. Suppose war is coming. Alfred Lichtenstein. Suppose war is coming. Ha! There's been peace for too long. Then things will get serious. Trumpet calls will galvanize you and nights will be ablaze. You will freeze in your tent. You'll feel hot all over. You'll go hungry, drown, be blown up, bleed to death. Fields will rattle to death. Church towers will topple, horizons will be in flames, winds will gust, cities will come crashing down. The thunder of heavy guns will fill up the horizon from the hills all around. Smoke will rise and shells will explode overhead. Joining the colors, Catherine Tynan. There they go marching, all in step so gay. Smooth-cheeked and golden, food for shells and guns. Blithely they go as to a wedding day, the mother's sons. The drab street stares to see them row on row, on the high tram tops singing like the lark. Too careless gay for courage, singing they go into the dark. With tin whistles, mouth organs, any noise, they pipe the way to glory and to the grave. Foolish and young, the gay and golden boys, love cannot save. High heart, high courage, the poor girls they kissed run with them. They shall kiss no more, alas. Out of the mist, they stepped into the mist. Singing, they pass. Peace by Rupert Brooke, who noted, it's all great fun. Now, God be thanked who has matched us with his hour and caught our youth and wakened us from sleeping with hand made sure, clear eye and sharpened power to turn as swimmers into cleanness leaping, glad from a world grown old and cold and weary, leave the sick hearts that honor could not move and half men and their dirty songs and dreary and all the little emptiness of love. Oh, we who have known shame, we have found release there, where there's no ill, no grief, but sleeping has mending. Not broken save this body, lost but breath, nothing to shake the laughing heart's long peace there, but only agony, and that has an ending. And the worst friend and enemy is but death. <clears throat> This is no case of petty right or wrong by Edward Thomas. In this poem, Phoenix indicates a mythical bird that arose, that every five year, hundred year, self-immolated and arose from the ashes. This is no case of petty right or wrong that politicians or philosophers can judge. I hate not Germans nor grow hot with love of Englishmen to please newspapers. Beside my hate for one fat patriot, my hatred of the Kaiser is lover true, a kind of god he is, banging a gong. But I have not to choose between the two, or between justice and injustice. Dinned with war and argument, I read no more than in the wind, than the storm smoking along the wind athwart the wood. Two witches' cauldrons roar. From one the weather shall arise, clear and gay. Out of the other, an England beautiful, and like her mother that died yesterday. Little I know or care, if being dull, I shall miss something that historians can rake out of the ashes when perchance the phoenix broods serene above their ken. But with the best and meanest Englishman, I am one in crying, God save England lest we lose what never slaves and cattle blessed. The ages made her that made us from dust. She is all we know and live by, and we trust she is good and must endure, loving her so. And as we love ourselves, 
we hate her foe. The Soldier by Rupert Brooke. Wilfred Gibson on the death of Brooke. He's gone and I do not understand. I only know that as he turned to go and waved his hand, in his young eyes a sudden glory shone, and I was dazzled by a sunset glow, and he was gone. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's, breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by the sons of home. And think, this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and <coughs> laughter learnt of friends, and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. To Germany, Charles Hamilton Sorley. You are blind, like us. Your hurt no man designed, and no man claimed the conquest of your land. But gropers both through fields of thought confined, we stumble and we do not understand. You only saw your future bigly planned and we, the tapering paths of our own mind and in each other's dearest ways we stand and hiss and hate and the blind fight the blind. When it is peace, then we may view again with new one eyes each other's truer form and wonder. Grown more loving, kind and warm, we'll grasp firm hands and laugh at the old pain when it is peace. But until peace, the storm, the darkness, and the thunder, and the rain. If you go to this war and give your life, you could not end your life in a better way. For to give one's life for one's country, for a great cause, is a splendid thing. Emmeline Pankhurst. Marching Men, Marjorie Pickthall. Under the level winter sky, I saw a thousand Christs go by. They sang an idle song and free as they went up to Calvary. Careless of eye and coarse of lip, they marched in holiest fellowship. That heaven might heal the world, they gave their earthborn dreams to deck the grave. With souls unpurged and steadfast breath, they supped the sacrament of death. And for each one, far off, apart, seven swords have rent a woman's heart. Break of day in the trenches. Isaac Rosenberg. The darkness crumbles away. It is the same old druid time as ever. Only a live thing leaps my hand, a queer sardonic rat, as I pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear. Droll rat! They would shoot you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies. Now you have touched this English hand. You will do the same to a German soon, no doubt, if it be your pleasure to cross the sleeping green between. It seems you inwardly grin as you pass. Strong eyes, fine limbs, haughty athletes, less chance than you for life, bonds to the whims of murder, sprawled in the bowels of the earth, the torn fields of France. What do you see in our eyes at the shrieking iron and flame hurled through still heavens? What quaver, what heart aghast. Poppies whose roots are in man's veins drop and are ever dropping, but mine in my ear is safe, just a little white with dust. Mm -hmm. 
It was the sight of the sky, almost alone, that had the power to persuade a man that he was not already lost in a common grave. Trenches, saint Eloi T. E. Hume. And in this poem, Belgian refers to a specific type of large workhorse, much like the Clydesdale. Over the flat slope of saint Eloi, a wide wall of sandbags. Night. In the silence, desultory men puttering over small fires, cleaning their mess tins to and fro. And from the lines, men walk as on Piccadilly, making paths in the dark through scattered dead horses over a dead Belgian's belly. The Germans have rockets. The English have no rockets. Behind the line, cannon, hidden, lying back miles. Before the line, chaos. My mind is a corridor. The minds about me are corridors. Nothing suggests itself. There is nothing to do but keep on. The Christmas Letter. This will be the most memorable Christmas I've ever spent or likely to spend. Since about tea time yesterday, I don't think there's been a shot fired on either side up to now. Some of our chaps went over to their lines. I think they've all come back bar one from the E Company. They no doubt kept him as a souvenir. We can hardly believe that we've been firing at them for the last week or two. It all seems so strange. From another letter. <clears throat> On December 24th, I was occupying a small post very close to the front trench. In the afternoon, about 3 p.m., the Germans began singing louder than they had done hitherto. And I heard sundry shouts come over from their trenches after each song, such as, how's that, English? Our men replied and then sang songs themselves, which were applauded by the Germans, many of whom could speak English. The Germans then shouted across, if you don't shoot, we won't. Christmas Day dawned, showing the ground covered with a layer of snow. Around 11 a.m., <coughs> English and Germans were walking about freely in between the trenches. I went over and exchanged cigarettes for cigars with the enemy. It was certainly an experience I wouldn't have missed. And now, Christmas in the trenches. My name is Francis Tolliver. I come from Liverpool. Two years ago, the war was waiting for me after school. To Belgium and to Flanders, to Germany, to here. I fought for king and country I love dear. It was Christmas in the trenches where the frost so bitter hung. The frozen fields of France were still no Christmas song was sung. Our families back in England were toasting us that day, their brave and glorious lads so far away. I was lying with my messmate on the cold and rocky ground when across the lines of battle came a most peculiar sound. Says I, now listen up, me boy, each soldier strained to hear as one young German voice sang out so clear. He's singing bloody well, you know, my partner says to me. Soon one by one each German voice joined in in harmony. The cannons rested silent, the glass clouds rolled no more, as Christmas brought us respite from the war. As soon as they were finished, a reverent pause was spent. God rest ye merry gentlemen, struck up some lads from tent. The next they sang was stille Nacht, tis silent night, says I. And in two tongues one song filled up that sky. 
There's someone coming towards us, the frontline sentry cried. All sights were fixed on one lone figure trudging from their side. His truce flag, like a Christmas star, shone on that plain so bright as he bravely strode unarmed into the night. Then one by one on either side we walked into no man's land where neither gun nor bayonet we met there hand to hand. We shared some secret brandy and wished each other well and in a flare-lit soccer game we gave them hell. We traded chocolate cigarettes and photographs from home. These sons and fathers far away from families of their own. Young Sanders played his squeeze box and they had a violin. This curious and unlikely band of men. Soon daylight stole upon us and France was France once more. With sad farewells we each began to settle back to war. But the question haunted every heart that lived that wondrous night. Whose family have I fixed within my sights? It was Christmas in the trenches where the frost so bitter hung. The frozen fields of France were warmed as songs of peace were sung. For the walls they'd kept between us to exact the work of war had crumbled and were gone forevermore. My name is Francis Tolliver, in Liverpool I dwell. Each Christmas come since World War I, I've learned its lessons well. That the ones who call the shots won't be among the dead and lame. And on the end of the rifle, we're the same. Nice. The High Command. In response to the British and German soldiers observing an informal ad hoc Christmas Day truce, where they met in no man's land to exchange cigarettes and take snapshots, the outraged British general staff forbade this to ever happen again. 1915. Germans sink RMS Lusitania, the Dardanelles campaign, Battle of Gallipoli, Second Battle of Ypres, first use of poison gas. All imagined it would be an affair of great marches and great battles, and quickly decided. <laughs> War Girls, Jesse Pope. <coughs> There's the girl who clips <coughs> your ticket for the train, and the girl who speeds the lift from floor to floor. There's the girl who does a milk, mount, milk round in the rain, and the girl who calls for orders at your door. Strong, sensible, and fit, they're out to show their grit and tackle jobs with energy and knack. No longer caged and penned up, they're going to keep their end up till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. There's the motor girl who drives a heavy van. There's the butcher girl who brings your joint of meat. There's the girl who cries, all fares please, like a man. And the girl who whistles taxis up the street. Beneath each uniform beats a heart that's soft and warm. Though of canny mother wit they show no lack, but a solemn statement this is, they've no time for love and kisses till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. Wild Geese, Walter Flex. Wild geese are rushing through the night with shrill cry. Northbound rangers. Hazard awaits. Take care. Your flight and world are full of dangers. Fly through the night-filled air, my friends, you squadron gray and mighty. Dawn breaks as battle cry extends far o'er the lands below you. Fly on. Rush on, you gray-winged flight. Rush on to Northland safety. When you fly south again some night, what will my fate 
have made me. We are, as you, a gray clothes pack, the Kaiser's fighting yeoman. Should our flight end with no way back, fly south and sound our amen. June 1915, Charlotte Mew. <coughs> Who thinks of June's <coughs> first rose today? Only some child, perhaps, with shining eyes and rough bright hair will reach it down in a green sunny lane to us almost as far away as are the fearless stars from these veiled lamps of town. What's little June to a great broken world with eyes gone dim from too much looking on the face of grief, the face of dread? Or what's the broken world to June and him of the small eager hand, the shining eyes, the rough bright head? Attack by Siegfried Sassoon. At dawn, the ridge emerges massed and dun in the wild purple of the glowering sun. Smoldering through spouts of drifting smoke that shroud the menacing scarred slope, and one by one tanks creep and topple forward to the wire. The barrage roars and lifts, then clumsily bowed with bombs and guns and shovels and battle gear, men jostle and climb to meet the bristling fire. Vines of gray, muttering faces, masked with fear, they leave their trenches, going over the top, while time ticks blank and busy on their wrists, and hope with furtive eyes and grappling fists flounders in the mud. Oh, Jesus, make it stop! The VAD Brigade. VAD uh, are shorthand for a Voluntary Aid Detachment, an army branch of nursing volunteers working in hospitals and other treatment facilities. And ANZAC, as used in this poem, stands for the Australia New Zealand Army Corps. I thought I knew each regiment, battalion, and brigade until I got to Bristol by Red Cross train conveyed, and saw upon the platform a company in blue of goodly wives and daughters and little flappers, too. I whispered to a comrade, pray tell, who are these with smiles upon their faces? He answered, VADs. They're called the pillow smoothers. They have another name, the very artful darlings, and well, they play their game. I am but a shy young Anzac, not used to women much. I've always dreaded nurses and hospitals and such. How was I going to stick it until my wounds were well? A crown of them all fussing far worse than shot or shell. I lay upon a stretcher, a little girl tripped up. My cigarette she lighted and held my coffee cup. And could she write a postcard to send to any friends? Or would I like a pillow? She bucked me up no end. I had no friends in Blighty, and when the pain got worse, I never could have stood it without that little nurse. A father, mother, sister, and sweetheart all in one. If I had not adored her, I must have been a hun. But what if I should lose her? I know I'll put a ring upon her wedding finger to claim my little thing. And when the war is over, if I should lucky be, that very artful darling perhaps may cross the sea. The Sparkling Dardanelles, John Hartshorn. <clears throat> Do you see the waters of the Sparkling Dardanelles? Do you see the rugged beauty of April at Cape Hells? Do you see the scudding clouds against the deep blue sky? Do you think of this as paradise or as a place to die? We came in springtime long ago. We never left. We never went home, just fading ghosts in sepia, now lost amongst the stone. Call out and we will answer, whispered word, a shadow, 
bleached bones and twisted fragments, a glimpse of who we were. So, walk with us amid the mullahs, reach out across the years, we'll show you where we made our stand, where still we guard this rugged land. As the birds sing and the Dardanelles sparkle, think of us still here. Your time with us was brief, now done, but our time here has just begun. And the band played Waltzing Matilda. When I was a young man, I carried my pack and I lived the free life of a rover. From the Murray's Green Basin to the dusty outback, I waltzed my Matilda all over. Then in 1915, my country said, son, it's time to stop rambling. There's work to be done. So they gave me a tin hat and they gave me a gun. And they sent me away to the war. And the band played waltzing Matilda. As a ship sailed away from the quay. And amidst all the tears, the flag waving and cheers. We sailed off for Gallipoli. How well I remember that terrible day when our blood stained the sand and the water. And how in that hell they call Suvla Bay we were butchered like lambs at the slaughter. Johnny Turk, he was ready. He primed himself well. He rained us with bullets and he showered us with shell. And in five minutes, flat, we were all blown to hell. He nearly blew us back home to Australia. And the band played waltzing Matilda as we stopped to bury our slain. Well, we buried ours, and the Turks buried theirs. Then it started all over again. Now those who were living just tried to survive in that mad world of blood, death and fire. And for ten weary weeks I kept myself alive while around me the corpses piled higher. Then a big Turkish shell knocked me ass overhead and when I awoke in my hospital bed and saw what it had done, then I wished I were dead. I never knew there were worse things than dying. And no more I'll go waltzing Matilda all around the green bush for a near but to set tent and pegs, a man needs two legs. No more waltzing Matilda for me. They collected the wounded, the crippled, the maimed, and they shipped us back home to Australia. The armless, the legless, the blind and the insane, 
<laughs> those proud wounded heroes of Suvla. And when our ship pulled into Circular Key, and I looked at the place where my legs used to be, I thank God there was no one there waiting for me to grieve and to mourn and to pity. And the band played waltzing Matilda as they carried us down the gangway. Oh, but nobody cheered. They just stood there and stared. <coughs> then they turned all their faces away. Now, every April, I sit on my porch and I watch the parade pass before me. I see my old comrades, how proudly they march, reliving their dreams of past glories. I see the old men, all stiff, tired, and worn, the forgotten heroes of a forgotten war. And the young people ask, what are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question. And the band plays waltzing Matilda. And the old men still answer the call. But year after year, their numbers get fewer. Someday no one will march there at all. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda, who'll come a waltzing Matilda with me? And their ghosts can be heard as they whisper through the billabong. There'll be no more waltzing Matilda with me. Nineteen sixteen, the Battle of Verdun, Battle of the Somme. <coughs> President Wilson re-elected with campaign slogan, "He kept us out of the war." Leaving for the front, Alfred Lichtenstein. <coughs> Before I die, I must find this rhyme. Be quiet, friends, and do not waste my time. We're marching off in company with death. I only wish my girl would hold her breath. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm glad to leave. Now mother's crying too. There's no reprieve. And now look how the sun's begun to set. A nice mass grave is all that I shall get. Once more, the good old sunset's glowing red. In 13 days, I'll probably be dead. Anthem for Doomed Youth by Wilfred Owen. The word orison, as used in this poem, means prayer. <clears throat> what passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers, nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held 
to speed them all. Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall. Their flowers, the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk, a drawing down of blinds. Perhaps Vera Britton, dedicated to her fiance, Roland Aubrey Layton, who was killed at the age of 20 by a sniper, four months after she had accepted his marriage proposal. Roland to Vera shortly before being shot. Violets from Plug Street Wood, think what they have meant to me, life and hope and love and you. And you did not see them grow where his mangled body lay, hiding horror from the day. Sweetest, it was better so. Perhaps someday the sun will shine again, and I shall see that the still the skies are blue, and feel once more I do not live in vain, although bereft of you. Perhaps the golden meadows at my feet will make the sunny hours of spring seem gay, and I shall find the white may blossom sweet, though you have passed away. Perhaps the summer winds will shimmer bright and crimson roses once again be fair and autumn harvest fields a rich delight, although you are not there. Perhaps someday I shall not shrink in pain to see the passing of the dying year and listen to the Christmas songs again, although you cannot hear. But though kind time may many joys renew, there is one greatest joy I shall not know again, because my heart for loss of you was broken long ago. Glory of women, Siegfried Sassoon. You love us when we're heroes, home on leave, or wounded in a mentionable place. You worship decorations, you believe that chivalry redeems the war's disgrace. You make us shells. You listen with delight by tales of dirt and danger fondly thrilled. You crown our distant ardors while we fight and mourn our laureled memories when we're killed. You can't believe that British troops retire when hell's last horror breaks them and they run trampling the terrible corpses blind with blood. Oh, German mother dreaming by the fire, while you are knitting socks to send your son, his face is trodden deeper in the mud. <clears throat> to his love, Ivor Gurney. He's gone, and all our plans are useless indeed. We'll walk no more on Cotswolds, where the sheep feed quietly and take no heed. His body that was so quick is not as you knew it on Severn River under the blue, driving our small boat through. You would not know him now, but he still died nobly, so cover him over with violets of pride, purple from Severn's side. Cover him, cover him soon, and with thick-set masses of memoried flowers, hide that red, wet thing I must somehow forget. As the sun died in blood, Tom Kettle. As the sun died in blood and hill and sea, grew to an altar, red with mystery, one came who knew me, it may be overmuch, seeking the cynical and staining touch, but I, against the great sun's burial, thought only of bayonet flash and bugle call, and saw him as God's eye upon the deep, closed in the dream in which no women weep, and knew that even I shall fall on sleep. To death, Garrett Engelka. War is the negation, or at least the degeneration, of the soul and the furthering of the material world's power. <coughs> Mr.
but spare me death. I am still young. <clears throat> My work has not been done. The future is still unknown. So spare me death. Some time later, death, when my life has been lived, has burned away into my work, and I have nothing left to say, then take me death. To a missing friend, Goldfield, an otherwise unknown German-Jewish poet. You have no grave, no cross, but you die. Maybe in some dark thicket your bones lie, or you were sunk in swamp in deep of night, or Cossacks cruelly robbed you of the light. And when it was, and where, and how, and why, I know not. Death in forest does not cry. You are a skull now, white bleached by the rain, round which the weasel lightly leaves the train. You are the plowed earth on which horses stand, you are the grain that once did crown the land. You are the bread the farmer once did eat. You are the strength when peace returns to greet. Nineteen seventeen, the Germans issued the Zimmerman telegram to Mexico. The United States declares war on Germany. The draft begins. U.S. troops land in France the Third Battle of Ypres, and the Bolshevik uprising in Russia. Prayer Before Battle, Alfred Wittgenstein. The troops are singing fervently, each for himself. God, protect me from misfortune. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that no grenades strike me. That the bastards, our enemies, do not catch me, do not shoot me. That I don't die like a dog for the dear fatherland. Look. I would like to go on living, milk cows, bang girls, and beat the bastard sap. Get drunk often until my blessed death. Look, I eagerly and gladly recite seven rosaries daily if you, God, in your grace, would kill my friend Huber or Meyer and not me. <laughs> but if the worst should come, let me not be too badly wounded. Send me a slight leg wound, a small injury to the arm, so that I may return as a hero with a story to tell. When you see millions of the mouthless dead, Charles Hamilton Sorley. After the first day or two, the corpses swelled and stank. Those we could not get in from the German wire continued to swell until the wall of the stomach collapsed. A disgusting smell would float across. The color of the dead faces changes from white to yellow-gray to red to purple to green to black to slimy. Robert Graves. <clears throat> when you see millions of the mouthless dead across your dreams in pale battalions go, say not soft things, as other men have said, that you'll remember for you need not so. Give them not praise for death. How should they know it is not curses heaped on each gashed head? Nor tears. Their blind eyes see not your tears flow. Nor honor. It is easy to be dead. Say only this, they are dead. Then add there too yet many, a better one has died before. Then. Scanning all the o'ercrowded mass, should you perceive one face that you loved heretofore? It is a spook. None wears the face you know. Great death has made all his forevermore. In Flanders Fields by John McRae. Allenson, all the goddamn doctors in the world will not win this bloody war. What we need is more and more fighting men. In Flanders fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard 
amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from falling, ha failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Lights out, Edward Thomas. I have come to the borders of sleep, the unfathomable deep forest where all must lose their way, however straight or winding, soon or late, they cannot choose. Many a road and track that since the dawn's first crack, up to the forest brink deceived the travelers, suddenly now blurs and in they sink. Here love ends, despair, ambition ends. All pleasure and all trouble, although most sweet or bitter, here ends, ends in sleep that is sweeter than tasks most noble. There is not any book or face of dearest look that I would not turn from now to go into the unknown. I must enter and leave alone. I know not how. The tall forest towers, its cloudy foliage lowers ahead, shelf above shelf. Its silence I hear and obey, that I may lose my way and myself. <coughs> the Next War by Wilfred Owen, who in January 1917 writes to his mother, There is a fine heroic feeling about being in France, and I am in perfect spirits. Then two weeks later, to his mother, I can see no excuse for deceiving you about these four days. I have suffered seventh hell. I have not been at the front. I have been in front of it. Out there, we've walked quite friendly up to death, sat down and eaten with him, cool and bland, pardoned his spilling mess tins in our hand. We've sniffed the green thick odor of his breath, our eyes wept, but our courage didn't writhe. He's spat at us with bullets and he's coughed shrapnel. We chorused when he sang aloft. We whistled while he shaved us with his scythe. Oh, death was never enemy of ours. We laughed at him. We leagued with him, old chum. No soldiers paid to kick against his powers. We laughed knowing that better men would come and greater wars. When each proud fighter brags he wars on death for lives, not men for flags. The Falling Leaves, Margaret Postgate Cole. Today as I rode by, I saw the brown leaves dropping from their tree in a still afternoon when no wind whirled them whistling to the sky, but thickly, silently they fell, like snowflakes wiping out the noon, and wandered slowly thence, for thinking of a gallant multitude which now all withering lay, slain by no wind of age or pestilence, but in their beauty strewed, like snowflakes falling on the Flemish clay. The Mortars, Albert Paul Grenier. <clears throat> Juttering iron buckets clanging, jerking dead weight chains clanking. The thunder lumbering caravan labors on along the baking roads and tracks all thunderous crash and clash. The straining weary horses ponderingly nod, as though to doubt their onward slog will ever end. Wheels as thick as millstones mill the crunching road, and in towns and villages along the way, thunderstruck groups watch the deadweight cortege of death grind past. The squat carriages 
bolt, stubbled, muscles bulging, and mute, menacing, brutal, the black barrels muzzled and bound like lunatics. Roundel, Vera Britain. But far the most dangerous thing is going out on patrol in no man's land. You take bombs in case you should meet a hostile patrol, but you might be surrounded. You might be seen especially if you go very close to their line. Lights are always being sent up and they make night into day, so you have to keep down and quite still. Edward, her brother, to Vera. Like her fiance, her brother was also a casualty of war. Because you died, I shall not rest again, but wander ever through the lone world wide, seeking the shadow of a dream grown vain, because you died. I shall spend brief and idle hours beside the many lesser loves that still remain, but find in them none my triumph and my pride. And disillusion's slow corroding stain will creep upon each quest but newly tried. For every striving now shall nothing gain, because you die. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me. Every son of liberty. Hurry by the way, don't delay me today. <coughs> when your daddy glad to have had, had such a lad, tell your sweetheart not to pine. Be proud of her boys in line. Over there, over there, over there. send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming. Rum, rum, tummy everywhere. So be there. Say a prayer. Say the word, say the word, so beware. We'll be over, we're coming over. And we won't come back till it's over, over there. And one more time. Over there. They did not pursue worldly rewards. They wanted nothing more than to live without regret. Brothers pledged to the honor implicit in living one's own life and dying one's own death. Hail, brothers. Goodbye to you, the exalted dead. To you, we owe two debts of gratitude forever, the glory of having died for France and the homage due to you in our memories. I have a rendezvous with death at some disputed barricade when spring comes back with rustling shade and apple blossoms fill the air. I have a rendezvous with death when spring brings back blue days and fair. It may be he shall take my hand and lead me into his dark land and close my eyes and quench my breath. It may be I shall pass him still. I have a rendezvous with death on some scarred slope of battered hill when spring comes round again this year and the first meadow flowers appear. God knows twere better to be deep pillowed in silk and scented down where love throbs out in blissful sleep, pulse nigh to pulse and breath to breath where hushed awakenings are dear. But I have a rendezvous with death at midnight in some flaming town when spring trips north again this year and I to my pledged word am true I shall not fail that rendezvous on the eastern front 
by Georg Truckel. The wrath of the people is dark. Like the wild organ notes of winter storm, the battle's crimson wave, a naked forest of stars. With ravaged brows, with silver arms to dying soldiers, night comes beckoning. In the shade of the autumn ash, ghosts of the fallen are sighing. Thorny wilderness girdles the town about. From bloody doorsteps, the moon chases terrified women. Wild wolves have poured through the gates. Sounds of Elul by Robert Ziegel. A black and rainy evening with vague feelings of fear, alive with garish shrieking of shots both far and near. What brings you laughing soldier to my heart's dark command? when I, pensive and sober, in my own grave do stand. What strange column, unmoving, appears with such dark dread? Oh, friends, are you still living? Death is your realm not fed? At home with pious greeting, loved ones the graves do search. Where are the dead now meeting? The wind blows o'er the church. Death touches grave and heather, and sings, this I have done. Perhaps from my eyes forever, night will not hide the sun. Okay. A Hero's Dream, Dimcho de Belyanov. The enemies retreated, and the noise and smoke of battles drifted over the hill. Sleep and relief descend on weary eyes, and now once more the battlefield lies still. And he, too, shuts his eyes and falls asleep, his rifle butt supporting head and limb, and thinks he hears his mother in the deep, enfolding silence, whispering to him. Fear not the foe, my son. Fear not his challenge. Even though in battle you may soon be killed, your native land expects you to avenge 500 years of blood guiltlessly spilled. If you are to die, die like a man, my son. If you return, then know that the whole nation will honor you for all that you have done, staking your young life without hesitation. Then she fell silent. He reached out and tried to embrace her. Then he saw, as he was waking, the morning star still hanging in the sky. As on the horizon the new day was breaking, the trumpet sounded the alarm, and while fighting the battle with disdain of death, he fell on his young lips a quiet smile, a gallant hero to his final breath. Nineteen eighteen, U.S. President Wilson issues fourteen points to peace. <coughs> Germany launches spring offensive. Germany bombs Paris. United States launches attacks at Bella Wood and Argonne Forest. Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicates, and Germany signs armistice on November 11th. Here dead we lie, A. E. Hausmann. Here dead we lie, because we did not choose to live, and shame the land from which we sprung. Life, to be sure, is nothing much to lose. But young men think it is. And we were young. The Cenotaph, Charlotte Mew. <clears throat> Not yet will those measureless fields be green again, where only yesterday the wild, sweet blood of wonderful youth was shed. There is a grave whose earth must hold too long, too deep a stain, though forever over it we may speak as proudly as we may tread. But here, where the watchers by lonely hearths from the thrust of an inward sword have more slowly bled, we shall build the cenotaph. Victory, 
winged with peace, winged too at the column's head. And over the stairway at the foot, oh, here leave desolate, passionate hands to spread violets and roses and laurel with small, sweet, tink twinkling country things. Speak so wistfully of other springs. From the little gardens of the little places where sun or sweetheart was born and bred. In splendid sleep with a thousand brothers, to lovers, to mothers, here too lies he. Under the purple, the green, the red, it is all young life. It must break some women's hearts to see such a brave gay coverlet to such a bed. Only when all is done and said, God is not mocked, and neither are the dead. For this will stand in our marketplace. Who'll sell, who'll buy? Will you or I lie to each other with better grace? While looking into every busy whore and huckster's face as they drive their bargains is the face of God and some young, piteous, murdered face. The Soldier Soliloquies. Marc de Larigui de Sevrieux. After the Chalois affair, and since we waved the Marne goodbye, I drag my carcass everywhere but never know the reason why. In trench or barn, I spend each day, from fort or attic, glimpse the sky, at the swore simply slog away, but never know the reason why. I ask, hoping to understand this slaughter's purpose. The reply I get is, for the motherland, but never know the reason why. Better for me to just keep mum, and when it's my own turn to die, depart this life for kingdom come, but never know the reason why. The Andante by Albert Paul Granier. The rain endlessly unraveling. The rain shoveling at the mud the whole sullen day. The rain unendingly sobbing its toneless chords and the whispering wind crumbling the cloud into drizzle. Why, this evening am I haunted so by that majestic Andante from the Seventh Symphony, its chords as magnificently simple, simple as the triumphal arches of the ancients hold me in a vast enchantment. Its harmony is velvet to my soul, its murmur a caress that soothes the melancholy as we pick our way along the bank of this canal. The rain has never stopped. The mud is all long, snaking rivulets of agate and clouded onyx chopped into splashes with every drawn out hooffall of my horse. The rain has never stopped the whole lead blue day. The Andante gently eases my resentment with its divine serenity. <sighs> Those Sunday afternoons, not two years ago. The Sunday afternoons, the lamplit hall, the huge orchestra, a single mind and spirit in every flying bow tip. The mag miraculous fluid, a fountain spreading up to the galleries, then falling like snowflakes onto souls laid bare, like springtime sunlight through stained glass on a girl's communion veil. The Andante. The Andante is gentle with a touch of sadness like an autumn evening over ponds or the voiceless of an organ. And my chrysalid soul weaves itself a wonderful cocoon from this aching blessedness on the purple silk weft of the rain. <coughs> well, how do you do? Mind if I sit down here by your great side and rest for a while in the warm summer sun. I've been walking all day and I'm nearly done. 
I see by your grave start you were only 19 when you joined the great fall in in 1916. Well, I hope you died quick and I hope you died clean. Young Willie McBride was it slow and obscene? Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they play the fight slowly? Did they sound the death march as they lowered you down? Did the band play the last post and chorus? Did the pipes play the flowers of the forest? Did you leave a wife or a sweetheart behind? In some faithful heart is your memory enshrined. And though you died back in 1916, in some faithful heart, are you forever 19? Or are you a stranger without even a name, enshrined forever behind a glass pane? In an old photograph torn and tattered and stained, and fading to yellow in a brown leather frame. Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they play the fife lowly? Did they sound the death march as they lowered you down? Did the band play the last post and chorus? Did the pipes play the flowers of the forest? Well, the sun now, it shines on the green fields of France. There's a warm summer breeze makes the red poppies dance. And look how the sun shines from under the clouds. There's no gas, no barbed wire, there's no gunfire now. But here in this graveside is still, still no man's land. The countless white crosses in mute witness stand. To blind man's indifference to his fellow man. To a whole generation that was butchered and damned. Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they play the fife slowly? Did they sound the death march as they lowered you down? Did the band play the last post and chorus? Did the pipes play the flowers of the forest? Well, Willie McBride, I can't help wonder why Do those that lie here know why they did die? And did they believe when they answered the cause? Did they really believe that this war would end war? Well, the sorrow, the suffering, the glory, the pain, the killing and dying were all done in vain. For young Willie McBride, it happened again and again, and again and again, and again and again. Did they beat the drum slowly? Did they play the fife slowly? Did they sound the death march as they lowered you down? Did the band play the last post and chorus? Did the pipes play the flowers of the forest? Dulce et decorum est, Wilfred Owen. Dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. How sweet and honorable it is to die for one's country. Five nines in this poem refers to German artillery shells. <clears throat> Bent double, like old beggars under sacks. Knock need, coughing like hags we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk, with fatigue, deaf, even 
to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that drop behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning in all my dreams. Before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. November 11th, 1918. On the fourth army front, at two minutes to 11, a machine gun fired off a complete belt without pause, a single Machine gunner was then seen to stand up beside his weapon, take off his helmet, bow, and, turning about, walk slowly to the rear. And there was a great calm. Thomas Hardy. Breathless, they paused. <clears throat> Out there, men raised their glance to where had stood those poplars lank and locked. As they had raised it through the four years' dance of death, in the now familiar flats of France, and murmured, strange this, how? All firing stopped? Aye, all was hushed. The about to fire fired not. The aimed at moved away in translipped song. One checklist regiment slung a clinching shot and turned. The spirit of irony smirked out, what? Spoiled per adventures woven of rage and wrong? Thenceforth, no flying fires inflamed the gray. No hurtling shook the dewdrop from the thorn. No moan perplexed the mute bird on the spray. Worn horses mused, we are not whipped today. No weft-winged engines blurred the moon's thin horn. Calm fell. From heavens distilled a clemency. There was peace on earth and silence in the sky. Some could, some could not shake off misery. The sinister spirit sneered. It had to be. And again, the spirit of pity whispered, why? <laughs> 